Hello everyone um, and welcome. Um, I'm Jenny and I'm from the JS Group and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our Boost Your Skills live event. For those of you who are new to these events, our Boost Your Skills events focus on supporting students with um, study skills, employability and well-being. Today we welcome Sarah Myhill to share her experience on improving your grades with out-of-the-box thinking. I'd like to thank Sage Publishing and Sarah for helping us to provide this event for free to students to support their learning. Um, this is a webinar, which means that you will not be able to turn your cameras on, but there's plenty of times that you can join in um, either in the chat section or with the live polls, and we'd really love to hear from you. So um, please don't, don't be shy. Uh, we won't be judging anything that you have to say um, at all. And um, if you do you want to join with the live polls? They are all anonymous. So um, again, no one will see how you're voting. Um, we will also have a Q&A section at the end of the event. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask, just pop them into the Q&A section and we will get to them at the end of the event. This event is being live streamed onto our YouTube channel and will be saved there. So don't worry if you've missed something. I'll be sharing the link to the video and the slides after the event. So um, I will hand over to Maria now, who um, is from SAGE, and will introduce Sarah. Hi, everyone. And as Jenny said, thank you for joining us today. My name is Maria. I'm a marketing executive at SAGE Publishing, working on some brilliant study skills books. And I'm really delighted to introduce you today to Sarah Myhill. Sarah is the specialist dyslexia tutor and lecturer at the University of Buckingham. She is the author of Be a Brilliant Dyslexic Student, a positive study guide for students with dyslexia that Sage will be publishing in June this year. In today's talk, Sarah will be showing you some lesser known study skills featured in her book that will help, that will help you study smarter and achieve your academic goals. I'll hand over to you, Sarah. Okay, thanks, Maria. Um, yes, I'm uh, work with uh, students and um, I'm at the University of Buckingham, and they say what's good for dyslexic students is good for all students, and I've certainly found that to be the case. Students today have very small attention spans. It seems to be a, a an increasing problem amongst everyone, um, not just students with dyslexia. So I found that a lot of the um, more sort of snappy ways of um, being able to present study skills and for students to absorb it um, have worked very well for all students. So um, we have students from across the board, law students, medical students, um, psychology. So uh, it seems to be that these um, tips have worked for lots in my experience of the last seven years. So uh, hopefully they'll work for you. Uh, first slide, please, Jenny. So that's just about me. And um, the book is just a, a, a study skills book um, in the quick study skills series for SAGE or super quick study skills. And, um, and that's certainly where I've focused a lot of my attention because it seems that you can get information to people um, and they can absorb it without getting too bored. Um, and it seems to be effective, certainly with the students that I've worked with. Uh, next slide. So um, I don't know whether any of you want to see, sort of answer these queries. Um, as Jenny said, it's anonymous. So um, these questions, so see, see, um, Know, see how you feel about this. I know a lot of the students I see feel that the increased reading load at university is huge and, um, and there can be a lot to read, particularly in some of the subjects like law, psychology um, and medicine. Um, so reading and remembering is a skill that needs to um, be worked on and hopefully have some strategies that help. Um, it looks like most students have um, voted now. Um, if you, um, if the screen isn't popping up for you with the buttons and you're not sure how to vote, you can always pop your answer into the chat box. Um, but it looks like most people have been able to vote, so I'll just end the poll and share the results. So it looks like um, 
it's almost an even split between sometimes and always. So 38% um, of attendees said always, 19% said often, 40% said sometimes, which is the most, and then 2% um, said never. So it's um, obviously something that most people have experienced at some time. Um, I think everyone feels overwhelmed by their workload at university at some stage. So uh, hopefully some of the tips will, will help. Okay. Um, the next slide coming up. So um, I always say read a book like a jigsaw. And what I mean by that is um, with a jigsaw, if I gave you one, you'd look at the box lid to see the picture. And then you'd look for the corner pieces, the straight edges, and then start filling in the detail. So try and read a book like that. Um, a lot of students um, initially read from, start at the beginning and finish at the end. Um, students, particularly dyslexic students, do not um, think in a linear way. It's actually most of us don't. And when you get the big picture of anything, your um, reading, your writing, um, even a task that you have to do, your brain sees it very differently. It sees the boundaries and um, it, it is able then to slot in the detail a lot more easily than just um, starting at the beginning, finishing at the end. So getting a preview is one of my top tips of almost anything really. There's something called the 80-20 technique in business where you get 80% of your business is from 20% of your customers. So in a similar way, reading, you can get 80% of the meaning of a book by reading 20% of it. That's not the case for all books, but, but generally that's quite a good rule of thumb. So um, when you get a book, get the big picture, just flick through it, look from cover to cover, just get your mind around it, see what it's about just literally flick through it, skim and scan it, and then come back and even if it's an article your, and your lecture slides, just go through them quickly to see what everything's about. And then come back and read the introduction and don't read anything else, just go straight to the summary. Um, if it's a chapter, there's usually um, summaries at the end of that, um, go straight to the conclusion or a summary and then come back and um, look over the book again by reading all the chapter headings. And if you can, um, and you are able to interact physically with information and don't mind highlighting, highlight all the chapter headings and the subheadings, even if they're separated out and in bold, um, and highlight, say, take one highlighter color and go through and just read them. If you can read them out loud, it helps to embed the information as well go through and just read chapter headings, subheadings um, and highlight them. And then come back and read, if you need more information, come back and highlight and read the first sentence of every paragraph. That's the topic sentence. And it should say what the paragraph is about. So you've actually read a book four times um, fairly quickly, but you haven't actually read it in detail. It keeps your interest high. Um, it helps with concentration. But you've also know quite a lot about that before you actually start reading in depth. You might not even need to read chapters eight and nine. So you've actually gone through that and sort of found out what you need um, to, you know, where the information is that you want. Um, I think that also leads on to when you're reading something, think about why you're reading it. You know, what do you want to get out of the book? Um, set goals and objectives. You wouldn't go on a journey and um, not know where you're going. Or you wouldn't go to, um, again, sort of a restaurant and vegetarian. You wouldn't go through all the meat dishes. You'd go straight to the vegetarian dishes. So try and use your head when you're reading and don't just read things once slowly. Read things two, three, four times more quickly. Um, there's something called mindset, uh, which when you go to, uh, to work or read something, it can be very helpful to think about the task that you're going to do before you actually do it. So spend five minutes before you read anything, thinking about anything you know about that subject before you actually start studying. Um, it helps new learning hooks onto old learning a lot more easily than just going in fresh. So 
try and think about you know anything you know about it and that um, thought process will help to hook the new learning in it is actually a research study technique again key words and key themes think about um, the words and your brain will start to look for them when you're reading read actively take notes while you're reading even if you never look at the notes again the kinesthetic action between your hand and your brain helps to start the embedding process of information they found that students who take notes, um, who take written notes, actually remember more than students who take typed notes. Dual reading is about having a book in front of you and maybe the bigger picture on the internet, on your computer. Um, so you flick between the two, it keeps interest high and it puts what you're reading into context. And then use the guide as you read. This can help you to read more quickly by using a pencil, a ruler, a chopstick. Um, there are reading rulers, but um, it helps to anchor your eyes to the page and helps you to read more quickly. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. So um, again, if we... Um, if you have a look and see whether this question is something that you relate to. I think everyone's got the hang of voting now. It's going, it's going up a lot faster this time. <laughs> Okay, it looks like most people have voted now. Like I said, if, if you do have any issues voting on the poll, then you can pop it into the chat. It's not a problem. Okay, it's slowing down a little bit now. So it's your last chance if you want to vote. Now is the time to do it. Okay, so I'll just end the poll and share the results. So, um, it's an interesting one, this one. So 25% um, said always, and then 37% said often, and 37% again said sometimes, and 2% said never. Again, it's obviously something that does affect most people some of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it does affect all of us, actually. Um, it can be very overwhelming when you start university to see so much new information. And actually learning hurts. You know, I, I sort of say to a lot of students um, who, who can't you know, cope with the amount of work that's sort of been thrown at them at the beginning. It's actually, it's hard learning new, um, you know, you're creating new neural pathways and it's a bit like learning to drive. It can be so difficult um, at the beginning but actually, after a while, it becomes second nature. So those new pathways are being forged and that hurts. But after you've done that, it, it becomes sort of something that you feel familiar with. So often the second year can feel easier simply because you've learnt a lot of new techniques. You're learning to study. You're learning a lot of new information. Um, and as I said, that can be a painful process. Um, next slide, please. So my other top tip is review. 80% um, of detail is forgotten for everybody within 24 hours. So um, if you can go through your lecture, your study, the book you've studied, anything that you've um, been, you know, sort of exposed to or read or um, within 24 hours, you will find you start the embedding process. Um, and, you know, that is, as I said, the case for everybody. So um, even if it's after a lecture, go with a friend and with a coffee and talk about the lecture. Go home and just flick through your notes afterwards. It doesn't have to be really intense, but it does help to start that embedding process. Again, if you can then go through it 10 to 15 minutes the next day and then five minutes on day seven and two minutes on day 30, you'll find you haven't got this huge mountain of information to relearn basically when you get to the exams so try and keep um you know try and follow the 
rules of review because it is a really important study technique and can make a big difference to your life at university. As it says there, it, um, five minutes can potentially save you hours of time when you come to the exam. So I would say give it a go and, um, and try and start this sort of memorising embedding process uh, within 24 hours. OK, next slide, Jenny. So same as before, um, just tap on the button that um, is most relevant for you. And it looks like everyone is firing away on that one as well. Okay, so anyone else that wants to vote, um, I'm going to give you one, a couple more seconds. Okay, right, let's end the poll and share the results. So, um, got 23% said always, 38% said often, 36% said sometimes, and 4% said never. So we're looking at a similar sort of pattern across most of these answers, I think, and if it's the same people answering, that is. So I'll stop sharing so you can carry on with the presentation. Yeah, um, the students I'm seeing um, for academic skills and um, dyslexia are really suffering from um, lack of focus and concentration. Um, they're saying their attention spans for about 10 minutes. Um, I think it is to do with technology, with our phones, we're used to being distracted constantly and we're used to attending to a distraction um, straight away. In the past, people would have not had a phone or they would have just not concentrated on one thing and then concentrated on another. Um, we're quite used to multitasking these days, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually working um, in the, or doing any particular task to the best of your ability. So if you can concentrate on one thing at a time, that does make a big difference. Um, yes, next slide. Um, so one thing that does seem to help a bit is to um, break time down into 25 or 30 or 40 minute sessions. Um, the, the, the line at the bottom is actually a student who's been trying to work for two and a half hours um, concentration and recall has gone right down at the end of that time. You might think you're still concentrating and remembering, going to remember the information, but in fact you can't. The brain's a muscle and if you went to the gym you wouldn't just work out for two and a half hours without a break. So think about um, your brain in that way and um, break time down. Um, somebody, the line at the top is somebody who's studying for 25, 30 minutes with a five to 10 minute break and then starting another session. Um, so it's a, again, a research study skill which keeps concentration and recall high. Again, you can start to use the review process that I talked about in the last slide here. So you have a um, 25 minute study session, five to 10 minute break. Don't go on your phone because you probably never come back, but go and have a cup of tea, look out of the window, and then come back and before you start your next study session, just go over what you've just done. Um, just quickly look over, you start the embedding process then. Start your next study session and after your next break, come back and just look over the two sessions you've just done. And again, after the third, the three sessions you've just done. So you're starting that embedding process straight away. We tend to remember things at the beginning and end of a session as well, more than the middle. So you're giving yourself more beginnings and endings studying in this way. Um, there's various um, tools that you can use to help you. This is the Pomodoro technique, which is you know, very, very well known. Um, it breaks time down into 25 minute sessions, but you can, make, you can alter that. Um, there's a link there um, to it, but um, 
there are others called flora and focus um, but they're basically timers so they're to break your time down and help you so start studying in the sort of method that I just outlined so um, I think I've certainly found it very effective for the students that I've been working with and um, and it has been it's sort of proven to really help um, with remembering as well so it, you're actually starting this reviewing process within your study skills session um, next slide please Jim so uh, my one of my other top tips is um, self-belief self-talk mindset I've talked about mindset before um, it's very your mindset is a set of beliefs that you already have perhaps from your parents from your schooling your peers um, but it it does sort of depend um, you know how you've been brought up what what you think and but those there is something called the growth mindset and um, there's been a study done by Carol Dweck in the states and um, she found that um, a group of failing math students were given um, study skills uh, tuition or they were told about the growth mindset the growth mindset is when you understand and believe that your mind is actually malleable it's um, something that can grow and change right up until the rest of your life uh, or your whole life but somebody with a fixed mindset will believe um, that they are born with a fixed intelligence or a fixed ability and um, and that and they won't actually sort of learn to grow and change in the same way as somebody who um, has got a growth mindset. So it's worth thinking about and um, it's worth realising that your mindset does have an impact on your studies and on your academic performance. Self-talk, um, as Will Smith says there, those who think they can and those who think they can't are both right. Um, so it's very important what you think about yourself. Obviously, we, a lot of students with dyslexia have come to me and they haven't been supported at school. They have very low self-esteem, but they're actually really um, have huge ability that that hasn't been supported or showcased at school. So um, a lot of my job is talking to them about self-talk and mindset. Next slide, please, Jenny. So um, student will come saying, I have a terrible memory. And um, I always say, well, actually saying that is reinforcing your negative belief and your terrible memory. Start to turn that around and um, say, well, actually I'm working on getting a, memory, a better memory. Um, even if, if you can't face saying, I've got a very good memory. Most people's memories are good, but it just depends how we choose to use them, whether you're concentrating at the time you heard information, which a lot of people aren't actually. Um, but try and have positive self-talk. You'll find it makes a huge difference um, to your life. Even the difference in saying I can do something or I can't do something, the sort of the feeling that goes with both those statements is very different. So try and have self-belief um, and try and use positive self-talk whenever you can. Um, it I can't tell you how important it is. I was listening to a story by um, somebody called Richard Wiseman who wrote a book called The Luck Factor and he did a various experiments to, um, to try and decide who to sort of find the difference between lucky and unlucky people. So one of the tests was to give everybody a newspaper and ask them to count the photographs in that newspaper. Um, within it, there were two half page ads, one that said there are 54 photographs in this newspaper and one that said, we'll give you a hundred pounds if you see this ad. The lucky people tended to see those two pieces of information, but the unlucky people didn't. So it really is, he basically came to the conclusion that lucky and unlucky people are more or less the same it's just your view it's your belief and your view of life if you narrow your focus you don't see as much as somebody who's got a wider perspective 
the good news is that he said that it was very easy to change an unlucky person into a lucky person by making them aware of this. So I'm making you aware of self-talk and self-belief today. Um, next slide, please, Jenny. Um, this is something that I developed through um, reading a book by Brian Greeson, Smart Thinking, but also observing students I see with dyslexia. Dyslexia um, has various um, difficulties, usually around the written word, um, and they've actually done neuroimaging and found that there's a weakness in the area of the written word. There's a strength in problem solving and creative thinking, a compensatory strength. Um, I certainly noticed that in being able to make, they, people can make connections very easily, good problem solving, good visual skills. But I think most people um, are very good at these sort of um, thinking skills and seeing connections if they choose to be aware of them. So sometimes being aware of things is all you need to start thinking about or something different or going down a different path and incorporating that into your learning. Uh, metacognition is something that um, I also teach. It's basically thinking about how you think and learn best. A lot of people don't think about their strengths and weaknesses, um, but if you do, you can often find strengths that can compensate for things you find more difficult. But have a think about how you learn, have a think about what you do best and, um, and try and um, use, use those skills in your life to achieve your, your best potential. So um, Brian Greeton talks about um, counterintuitive thinking. So we all have fixed beliefs, as I said before, which are from our peer group, our parents or upbringing, um, or we have various beliefs and um, we tend to reinforce those beliefs as we go about our lives. But if you can try and suspend your belief or try and think of things from somebody else's point of view, you can actually find solutions that you might not have found if you were ignoring them. A bit like um, the people in the research of Richard Wiseman in The Luck Factor. Don't cut off um, the wider perspective. Don't have too narrow a focus. So as it says there, try and suspend your normal beliefs. Um, and do counterintuitive thinking. So we all have intuitions, they're very good, but what are they based on? They are based on a lot of the time on your beliefs. So if you can withhold those for a little while, you might come up with some different solutions. And I'm just saying these things, they, they can have an impact on your um, assignments. You can come up with a, a different angle. Um, so as it says, for, forget your conscious self and try and know about yourself. Allow yourself space and time. Put your phone and your laptop aside sometimes and just spend five minutes contemplating or letting ideas come into your head. Reflection can be a very good way of coming up with new ideas because actually um, our brains are working and thinking about things all the time, even when we don't know that. So be curious and um, give your, your thoughts time to emerge. Um, don't worry about failure and setbacks. They're actually a human learning tool and very important to us. So they are stepping stones to success. So when you don't get a good grade in a, an assignment or an essay, come back and, um, and get feedback. Look at why you didn't do, do so well and apply next time, apply um, techniques to overcome those and you'll find you've really learned something and it's integrated into you. And it's been a very valuable learning lesson. Perseverance, um, persistence, grit. Dyson spent 25 years before he came up with the, um, the Dyson vacuum cleaner. So um, I know that Einstein as well said perseverance and grit are how he got moved with. So sometimes you have an idea when you're reflecting, but you don't write it down. They can disappear, so try and capture them if you can. And join ideas and make connections. And um, that really just means that in a way in our lives today, there aren't any original ideas. So most new ideas come from joining two old ideas. So look out for connections, look out for um, 
different solutions. Um, I think, you know, one story in Brian's book is that um, two women set up a company called Baby Mugs and um, they found, they noticed that their babies um, calmed and became happier when they saw the faces of smiling babies. And this must have happened for years, but um, they came up with a vid, they created a video of smiling baby faces and made a fortune from selling it to nurseries, to people individually, to libraries, anywhere where somebody might go with a baby and need um, a sort of soothing influence. So all they did was come see something that was age old and come up with a new idea based on that. So give yourself time to see connections and make reflections. And that's what I think fundamentally builds into sharp thinking. Next slide, please, Jenny. Um, work ethic. So um, the ability to put in more effort than the average student. Um, I'll only go through these quickly, but it's obvious that people who aren't going to, you know, when you go to university, it's great to have fun. And that's what it should be about. You're, you, you're sort of growing on so many different levels, socially as well as academically. But in the end, if you want to get that degree, you do have to put some effort in. So next slide, please, Jenny. Will Smith has a, I'm not saying everyone should have his work ethic, but he did get where he got today by, as he says, working when somebody else was sleeping. I'm not saying you should do that either, but it's worth thinking about your work ethic, um, having a routine, maybe even working like you would in a working day, um, to just think about where you want to go. Next slide, please. So these are just some um, tips for, um, for starting a work ethic. Goal setting, that's very important to think about where you want to go, where you want to get to. You can have long-term goals and shorter, so break a long-term goal down into shorter, more achievable goals, so you at least feel like you're achieving something. Um, I think they did a study at Harvard University and got people to write down some students to write down their um, one year, five year and 10 year goals and other people didn't. And they found the people that had set goals achieved a lot more in life. So there's something in it. Regrets, you don't want to look back and think, I wish I'd done more at university. Um, you need patience and um, as it says, compete with yourself, not your peers. A lot of us compare ourselves to others these days, but um, look at your own progress. As it says, it says um, you know, focus on yourself. You'll be amazed at what you can achieve and make sure you do see what you've achieved. You know, look back and think, oh, that's where I was and this is where I got to. But work ethic does boil down to self-discipline and routine in the end. So you do need to, um, you know, that routine doesn't have to be nine to five. It, it may well be sort of 12 to, you know, uh, nine at night or something but um it needs to fit in obviously with your university life but it it is very important to try and come up with some sort of pattern of behavior okay next slide please jenny so um this is our last question but um again the same technique applies Okay, it looks like most people have voted now, so um, I will be finishing the poll in a few seconds, so if you haven't voted and you want to, then do it now. Okay, so let's end the poll and share the results. So we've got 24% uh, of people said always, and again 24% of people said often, um, and the Majority of people, so 46% said sometimes, and 6% said never. 
again, it's sort of split, isn't it, across, but uh, it looks like everyone experiences that at university on occasion. Um, next slide, please. Um, we all um, think in multiple directions um, in uh, simultaneously, really, and not many people think in a linear way. So um, something like mind mapping can be a very good way of capturing your ideas um, initially. Um, you can have sort of a brain dump and collect all your ideas. Um, I, I do teach mind mapping for revision and um, sort of study techniques. But on this occasion, I just wanted to sort of remind everyone that you putting information down in a more global diagrammatic way can be very in tune with the way we think, but it can also help with um, memorizing information. Um, mind maps can be very good revision tools in that you can create a mind map, which isn't just about putting information down on a piece of paper. It's about boiling information down or reducing it down to key words, which link to a key image can be very helpful um, to trigger the related information. That's how a lot of memory masters work by linking information to other bits of information. And the more memorable we can make something, the more we're likely to remember it. Um, here, it's just about presenting sort of information in clusters. So you can start to form your paragraphs and think which ideas connect to other ideas. Mind maps are very good ways of being able to see connections. So you can then start to think, well, those um, pieces of information connect, they could go into one paragraph. Um, and also getting a sort of, as I say, this more global view. Mind maps do actually provoke something called radiant thinking, which is thinking outside of the mind map. So it can actually produce ideas that aren't even within the mind map. It starts your thinking process. Next slide, please, Jenny. There is a, a place for hand-drawn mind maps, which again have that kinesthetic action of embedding information between your hand and your brain. But um, online maps, um, they don't have any boundaries, so you can go out and out. They don't have this sort of provoking thinking process as much because they are bits of information linked by a line to another bit. But you can get information from the internet um, and it will bring the reference back with it. Um, mind view, which does cost money, um, but has the, um, you can actually, with the press of a button, you can change your mind map into a bird document, can be a very useful tool at university. Um, those are some links to some free mind mapping software, so you can always have a go with some of those. Next sl slide, please, Jenny. Um, yeah, so this is an example of using mind mapping to start your assignment to cluster your ideas. Um, I always say in a general um, essay, 10% for the introduction of the word count, 10% um, for the conclusion, divide the rest of the word count between the paragraphs that you want to create. And it can be suddenly make a 2000 word essay seem a lot less intimidating if you've only got to write three or 400 words in each paragraph. Um, so that's just an example of how you can start to plan your assignment um, in a more sort of diagrammatic way, rather than starting at the beginning, finishing at the end. You might not even do the introduction and conclusion, just start with, you know, paragraph five, if that's what appeals to you, or the method or discussion if you're doing a psychology essay. Next slide, please, Jenny. And I created this for University of Buckingham students. Um, it basically talks about um, you can put the title in the middle because that you can tend to drift away from the title when you're writing an essay. And it's very important to sort of type it out and pin it on the wall in front of you because that's what you've got to answer in the end. Um, put the word count in, as I say, 10% introduction, 10% conclusion, and then divide the rest of the word count, say, in a 2000 word essay, you've got 200, 200 divide the 1600 between the five, six or more paragraphs that you're going to do, create. And um, yes, it can be a lot less intimidating. Um, it also talks about following structure. 
it can make your writing flow more easily to follow the the topic sentence, the point you're trying to make, an example, analysis or evaluation and link back to the title or the um, next paragraph. When you, it can give a sort of structure to your writing and then it can help you, your thoughts to flow more easily because of that. Next slide, please, Jenny. This is just something that I put in at the end. I talked about metacognition earlier. Um, so this is an example of a metacognition map, which is um, divided into segments for you to place various activities that perhaps are personal to you or study techniques um, that you then map on here. And, um, and it can start to make you understand how you think and learn best. So we've got big picture thinking, which I talked about global thinking, going down into more detail. And we've got verbal and nonverbal. So um, it's got the answers of students here um, who've put written in what they find um, that they're good at. And they've clustered those or they've put those in different areas of each segment. Um, in the book um, that I've got coming out with Sage in June, um, they, um, it gives you some templates to start thinking about your own metacognition and your own way of thinking and thinking about what um, strengths you have. And also think about what makes you feel strong. You might be good at something, but not like it at all. So think about it in that way too. Next slide, please, Jenny. And then this is just another one thinking about um, sort of interacting, active, outgoing um, traits, verbal, nonverbal again, um, and then going down into more reflective um, traits. So you can uh, plot what your person, your sort of what do you feel that you're good at, or, or even um, things that you might want to um, be good at on something like this. So it just gets you to start thinking about the way you think and learn best. Um, I think that's it from the slides. Um, I was going, um, shall I try and share my screen, Jenny? Yeah, you should be able to do that over the top of this one and that would finish yeah. my share. Uh... Uh, Can everyone see that? Um, yeah, I can see it. Okay, so um, we use Teams at University of Buckingham. Um, I think I think Jenny said a lot of universities do these days. Um, but I just wanted to show you a couple of features within Microsoft um, accessibility features that might or might not be useful to you. Um, so if you bring up a um, a blank word new word page. So there's a little microphone in the corner here, and I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, I'm hoping this is going to work, but it can help you to get your thoughts structured on paper. Because sometimes you can think of things but not have time to get them written down. And then you can cut and paste the ideas after and put them into your assignment format. So that's quite helpful. I know it's not going to be very helpful if you've got an accent or, um, but if you can make it work and, and, um, and it is of use. I think I've just found a lot of people, students and staff don't even know about this. There's a little sort of what looks like a staircase next door, which is good for, um, you know, for editor it's called, so you can get rid of, um, um, you know, you can check the grammar and um, spelling, etc. And then um, if you go into view and then go into reading view, sometimes it comes straight up. It's called immersive reader and um, it brings up um, the writing for you. It shows, it brings up the nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, in different colors, which can be useful if you're trying to structure your writing and help it to flow. Um, you can change the background color. Um, but what, when you actually 
read something and you have it read to you at the same time, it can actually embed the information a lot more than just reading it. So it can be good to cut and paste your notes into Word Online. It works in OneNote as well. And I'm, if you use Microsoft Edge as your browser, you can get information from the internet read right out loud. Um, it has something called line focus, so you can pull that down over your reading if you find it distracting to have the whole text in front of you. Um, it has something called um, picture dictionary, so it will bring up a, a picture um, if you, I don't know what it, um, it doesn't seem to have much for that, but it, um, you can bring up pictures which can help with memorising information. As I said, it brings up the nouns, verbs, adjectives, and then um, you can change the text size, the font, and the background color. Sometimes the glare between black writing and the background white can make reading um, harder for a lot of people, actually. So here you can change the color, um, and sometimes it can make reading easier, even if it's just maybe blue writing or black writing on an apricot background. So that's it. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, so that's it from me. I hope that was helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just quickly share my screen to show the students your book that's due to come oh, out. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so that's this final slide here, um, which has a QR code. So if you do have your phone handy, you can scan this now. But don't worry, um, these slides will be coming out to you as well. So um, you will have access to it that way as well. So um, this is due to be published in June and the QR code link takes you to our website where you can buy it and you can also pre-purchase it so that um, when it does get published, it will come straight to you. So I will stop sharing that now because we have some questions in the chat. So I will have a look at that. So there's a few that came up earlier. So I will get to those ones first. Um, one of the first questions was, um, how can we encourage ourselves to study when we don't want to study? I think that's a fairly common, common issue there. Yeah, I think, um, well, that's procrastination really, isn't it? Which is a problem for everyone, not just for students. Um, I think one of the best things is um, using that study technique, um, sort of chunking your time, but also um, trying to say that you are going to actually um, start studying at a certain time. Um, say the next day you're going to start at 11 and you're just going to study for 15 minutes and, um, and then you're going to um, have a break. Um, also, if you can tell somebody that, even if it's just a friend or something, I know it sounds silly, but that accountability can be quite um, helpful. And also, um, when you get into something, and particularly if you've been really putting it off, it can really help. Well, you'll be amazed how much easier the task is once you've started. And you sort of think to yourself, well, I can't believe I've been putting this off this much and it's been dominating my life. So once you start, don't wait for motivation, do action before motivation. And I think you'll find it will start, it will start you getting going on it. A student came to me last week saying she just couldn't start her assignment. It, it was really getting to the point where she wasn't going to have enough time to do it, a law student. And um, so I just gave her an A3 sheet of paper and just said, write down anything you know about that subject for your essay now. And um, she sort of started and half an hour later, she was still there. And then she went, actually, I think I've cracked it now um, and went off quite happy. <laughs> it's hard getting past that first stage, isn't it, to get get it going. Um, the white yeah. page is, is quite yeah. a big thing, isn't it? No, it definitely is. OK, uh, we have an, a question about the Pomodoro technique. Um, uh, the person said that they quite like the idea of it, but They've never been able to adopt it because the five minutes breaks feels endless and boring and they just have difficulty staying put and not doing anything. So um, they were wondering what you'd suggest for them to do during those breaks, other than obviously look at their phones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
well, as I said, I'd go off and make a cup of tea or um, look out of the window. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be five minutes either. It's just, um, you know, just doing something else, going out of the room. Go and do, run up and down the stairs a few times, you know, if you're at home or in in um, somewhere else. Go and run around the block. But um, it helps the information to, in, to integrate with what you already know. So there is a purpose in those breaks. I think a lot of people and students don't realise how important breaks are. Um, they really do help give you a bit of energy to sort of start concentrating again. So go and sort of do star jobs or something. <laughs> um, someone, I'm sure I remember someone saying to me, um, they go and fold clothes because it keeps their hands busy, but their brain kind of yeah. free. So it, whatever suits you, I suppose. Um, we have a question from a tutor um, saying, how long would, do you think is the ideal time for students to stay still? Hmm. I mean, as I said, so many students are coming saying they've only couldn't concentrate for 10 minutes. But I'd say I, I would actually say like 30, 40 minutes, really. Um, I know that some people have lectures for an hour and a half or some of the medical students, are, you know, a couple of hours. But I don't think anybody's going to still be concentrating at the end of that time, particularly without a break. So maybe you know, 30, 40 minutes and have a break if it's a lecture. But I'd say the more breaks you can give, but I know you've got to then get back into concentrating again. But um, I'd say 30 or 40 minutes, probably, ideally. Okay. We've got someone saying, um, is there any technique to prioritise tasks um, to organise work and tasks that could ameliorate performance? Uh, well, there's lots of techniques online, aren't there? Um, there is actually Eisenhower's um, index, or it can be called Steve Covey's um, urgent important matrix. And um, if you have a look online, it's called Eisenhower's matrix. And um, it's where you divide tasks into important, important urgent, um, sort of basically don't bother. And um, and there's the other quadrant. Um, but if you if you have a look online, and what you do is you I um I think if you got the you know printed off that matrix, and used post coloured post it notes to try and prioritise your tasks. So most people think they can do seventeen things in a day, but you're not going to be able to. You're only going to be able to do, um, you know, three or four. So if you use the small coloured post-it notes, you can at least um, push them on to the next day and where they come in that priority. You know, your assignment in week seven might not be a priority at the beginning of term, but it soon will be. So you might not, um, you know, get it done in week one, but you will need to, by week four or something, at least start planning it. So I think prioritising tasks, there's a lot of um, links online, Trello and um, I, I know I've got a lot of links I could send to them if they want, but um, I think prioritising tasks is quite important and thinking about, you know, you might have a list of jobs for the day, but then your, you know, your washing machine breaks down or your tyre goes flat on the car. Those things have to be dealt with straight away. So they then push other tasks that you had um, sort of further down the list. So uh, I think prioritising is quite an important um, thing to think about. I think also if you could get a, I always say to students, we've got um, with that, you know, sort of, well, I produce a calendar for the university because we've got a two year degree. So we have very odd holidays. Um, we do a 9-11, 9-11 teaching term over the two, over the year. Um, if you can divide your week into basically morning, afternoon and evening, seven days a week, you've got 21 sessions in your life. And OK, and a, a lecture or tutorial is going to be in one of them and you're not particularly going to do much else in the morning. So try and fill in, you know, get your modules, use a different colour highlighter for each module, fill in morning, afternoon, evening with all your lectures and tutorials and social occasions and work. And you'll see what sort of time you've got left over to, you know, do your assignment or do something like relaxation or whatever you want to put in extra, you want to put into your life. 
Um, we've had quite a few questions about um, sort of ADHD and sort of how to work smarter with ADHD. And if you have any sort of resources that people could use or could read and look at from that yeah. area. I think um, I've been on quite a few conferences um, with to do with ADHD because it's difficult to know um, with, you know, with attention spans, what's causing it. But it does seem to be, as I said, um, a problem for most people. So um, I've, they've actually found that mindfulness um, is has a, a, an impact on ADHD. Um, and I do, they've said that it's one of the, um, you know, one of the things they're really looking into um, as supportive. Um, I know that a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to do meditation or mindfulness. But um, actually, if you can avoid distractions, even for a second, and build that up over a period of time to sort of 10 minutes, so you could even try and think of a colour or a symbol um, or um, a number or a shape, and just try and hold that in your mind, and you'll find everything on the planet floods in. But what it does do, is it starts to build up the focus area of your brain. And they found students who build up the focus area of their brains who basically practice mindfulness. And it doesn't have to be um, something to groan about and think, oh, I don't want to sit there and do that. You know, um, just start with a minute. See if you can hold a circle shape in your head for a minute. Because once you build up the focus area of your brain, they've actually found that students um, then go on to have higher grades because they've built up their concentration through the practice of mindfulness. So I would say, have a look into it. Um, I follow someone called John Kabat-Zinn who I read his book, Full Catastrophe Living. And um, he uh, is a doctor in, um, in the States and he uses it with patients who have chronic pain or have reached the end of the line with medicine. But he does something called the body scan. You can find it on YouTube. And um, it's a lying down exercise, which I found quite helpful because you know, you're know you not sort of shifting, thinking, oh, my back hurts and things. Um, you, can, you can actually sort of really concentrate on trying to clear your mind. And he talks about it, just making a space between your thoughts and um, the, the trying to create a space in your head. So, um, yeah, increase your focus and you do increase your grades, so it um, seems. We've had a few people asking about the book, so I'm just going to pop a link into the chat now. So um, you can click on that now and be taken straight to the book. And um, someone's already said that they've pre-ordered the book, so um, it's obviously had an impact on that. Um, so, um, yeah, anyone that was asking, if you just have a look in the chat now, you should be able to see a link. But if you do miss it in the chat, don't worry, I will send out the details after the event as well. So don't don't panic. You won't miss those details. Um, one, another question that we have is how do you help your student who needs to fidget um, so they have to have something in their hands? Um, I think. I understand that there's different ways of learning and a student actually, a medical student um, actually said the other week that he has to walk up and down while he's learning um, and has to say sort of everything out loud. I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to do that in the library, <laughs> but um, if you're able, I would say anything that helps you, think about what helps you. If it's like squeezing um, a ball, you know, one of those fidget balls or you know having sort of um something that um that suits the the way you learn um you know some people learn by having songs and doing you know sort of saying the information along to a song or having music in the background or something um i think these days just anything you can do to help yourself and then share your um you know what you found helps with your peer group because one thing I do is I see students but they might not know each other and I'm I'm always trying to share techniques um, with other students because they might not have thought of them or been aware of them so um, I think yes trying to build up that focus area of your brain um, is really important 
there's some um, something called forest i think an app which grows trees as you study and they die if you stop so that can be quite a, um, an impetus <laughs> um we have a question about sort of, um, remembering so this it, um, particular example is about remembering medical terms so they said do you have any suggestions on how to remember terms correctly so um they have um, similar, they mentioned similar medical terms like hypo and hyper. Is there any way to sort of train your brain to remember um, those? Well, I did come up with a game um, which um, I used with some medical students, and some of them have found them really helpful. Um, basically, the card game pairs or palmanism. I don't know if anyone's heard of that. It, you get a pack of cards and you place the 52 cards face down and this is a memory training game but it's also really effective for learning um, terms like we were talking about but you place the cards face down if you're using a pack of cards and then you place them down in a square and you pick up two cards and if they don't match like they're not two black queens or two red tens um, you put them down again but when you get a pair that do match, you pick them up and put them to one side, you take them out of the pack. So um, with the medical students, I got them to do diseases and what the symptoms were and or drugs and what the drugs do. So get your top 50 drugs, even top 100 drugs and do two packs. You can get cards online, um, which are blank business cards. So use those and then write the name spelt correctly on one card and then put what the drug does on another card and then shuffle them all. And while you're having, this is what you can do in your break, um, while you're having your five to 10 minute break, put spread the cards out on a table and play that game. So pick up a card, if it doesn't match the, um, you know, the card, other card you've picked up, put it down again. So you're starting to match them. But what it does is all these things are about keeping your brain interested. Our brains love games. And as soon as you make it into a game, it doesn't see it as such an onerous task. Um, make sure the words are spelt correctly. The other technique I do is get a, um, an address book and put subject specific words that you find hard to spell or need to remember the spelling of under the different, you know, it goes A, B, C put different words in there, spelt correctly with their meaning, and start to just flick through that sometimes in an odd moment. So um, there are a couple of tips. Thank you very much. Um, we're sort of um, running a little bit late, so I hope yeah. that um, everyone is happy with um, the answers and that we've we've got through most of the questions, I think. So uh, we've sort of um, maybe generalised a little bit on some of them, but um, we had lots of people saying thank you in the chat as well, Sarah, so just to let you know they're, they're really appreciating the advice. Um, okay. I'll just say again that um, we will be sharing a link to the video of the event and sh sharing the slides themselves. So all the links in the um, slides, you will have access to those links. So don't worry, um, you didn't have to make notes. We, we will be sharing them. Um, we also have um, a survey when you log out of the event that was just asking for your sort of feelings about the event. Um, and that really helps us to improve these events for sort of the future events that are coming up. We've also asked um, on that um, for any st study tips that you found really helpful to yourself. And we will use that information to make a document to share with all attendees. So um, that's just a sort of, um, really nice way to sort of share what's worked for you so that you can share it with uh, all the students that have attended this event. So if you do have time to pull that out, that would be really, really helpful. And um, thank you very much for attending. It's been great to have you with us and for joining in so much on the chat as well. And thank you, Sarah, for some really, really good, useful information there. That's, that's a pleasure. I hope it helps. <laughs> mm, I'm sure it will do. There's a lot of people saying it's very helpful, so I'm sure it will be. So right. um, okay. when I click end, that will end the event for everyone. So it'll be a bit abrupt, but so I just um, say one final goodbye before I go. <laughs> Okay, bye Thank everyone.